So without further ado, firstly, I would like to introduce um, Dr. Natalie Cole, a fellow colleague of mine at National Heart Center, and a good friend, who not just um, specialize in the field of cholesterol, but also have many other interests in echocardiography, cardiac computer tomography, and cardiometabolic diseases. So she'll be talking on cholesterol, the bad and the good. Natalie Cole, all yours. Thank you, um, Dr. Wong, for the kind introduction. Um, it has been a, a very, it's very nice to be invited to talk about this topic that I think many of us will have questions about, um, cholesterol, what's good and what's bad. So I think many of us, when we see the doctor, we wonder, you know, we look at our liquid, our lipid panels and we think, wow, there's so many types of cholesterol, which number do I look at? We'll go through that in this talk, as well as explain what are the different components of cholesterol, why some are deemed good and why others are deemed less good, are, are bad. So high cholesterol is actually no symptoms. So it's very hard if you don't do a blood test to know whether you have high cholesterol or not. And after the blood test, you would be able to see a few components of what comprises a lipid panel. So the first one, um, the cardiologist or endocrinologist or GP would always look at would be the low density lipoprotein. And this is known as bad cholesterol because it carries cholesterol to the tissues, including the arteries. High density lipoprotein is also colloquially known as good cholesterol because what it does is that it takes the cholesterol from the tissues to the liver where it can be removed from the body. So cholesterol is a waxy substance um, that is produced and released into the bloodstream by cells in the liver. And the body uses cholesterol to form cell, cell membranes, to aid in digestion, to convert vitamin D in the skin and to develop hormones. The cholesterol is stored inside a waterproof envelope of lipids, also known as fats, along with specific proteins that weave in and out of the envelope's outer shell, as you can see in this diagram. These particles are called lipoproteins. While there are several different types of lipoproteins, our cholesterol score measures just two, the low-density lipoprotein and the high-density lipoprotein. High-density lipoproteins remove cholesterol from the bloodstream and artery walls, and they, care, well, uh, and they also... A higher LDL score is therefore desirable and will improve your overall cholesterol score. The low-density lipoproteins, LDL, are considered bad because as earlier mentioned, um, while they carry the needed cholesterol to all parts of the body, they deposit cholesterol in the artery walls and start the process of atherosclerosis, which actually leads to blood vessel blockage. Triglycerides are another measure um, that you often see in the lipid panel. And cholesterol and triglycerides are stored in fat cells and used as an energy source for the body. High levels of blood triglycerides are often found in people who have high cholesterol levels, heart problems, are overweight, or have um, diabetes. So when we look at the total score for cholesterol, we add HDL plus LDL, and then 20% of the value of the triglycerides to get our total cholesterol score. Depending on which lab you use, it can be in milligrams or millimoles. So the goals of cholesterol management are when it comes to cholesterol, the key is to keep the LDL down while raising the HDL. The accumulation of too much LDL the bad cholesterol can lead to atherosclerosis, which is that plug buildup that we can see here. So cholesterol and coronary artery disease, the LDL actually deposits itself in the layers in the artery wall. And this is the disease process that results in coronary blockage and in some cases, acute heart attacks. Okay, it starts out as a fatty streak. Okay. And then the foam cells continue to expand the core of the plug the longer the fatty streak is there. And then a fibrous outer cap also forms from the converted smooth muscle cells and other elements. 
giving rise to cholesterol plaque. So in a very unstable plaque, what you'll see is a unstable, uh, with a, is a large part of disease, but only a very thin fibrous cap. And these types of plaques are very prone to plaque rupture, which is what can give rise to heart attack. So you can see the two different mechanisms of heart disease on this screen that are mitigated by bad cholesterol, LDL. The first on the left is blood vessel blockage, which leads to chest pain when you exercise, chest pain that is resolved when you rest, and it's usually central. The one on the left, we actually can have a bit of time to try and fix. If our patients present with symptoms, they usually walk into hospital and tell us about it, and we can investigate. The image on the right demonstrates the more acute setting, where whether your plug is 10%, uh, whether the plug is 10% of the pipe blocked, 50% or 70% blocked, it can suddenly rupture. Okay, there are certain features of the plug that can be seen on modern technology that allow us to predict, you know, that even if it is not severe blockage, this process can happen. And this is what we often call a heart attack. Patients don't always get to walk into hospital. If they collapse outside of hospital and brought in by an ambulance, the survival rate is 5% if the heart stops. And this is the process. We can't predict in whom this will happen. But we know that this process, like the other process on the left of the screen, is actually mitigated by bad cholesterol, also known as LDL. Okay. So what can we do about it? I think our next speaker, Dr. Lo Wan Jia, will give us an update as to what we have in modern science to teach us uh, to manage better and prevent heart attacks, strokes, and death. Um, and this is what we can do in terms of modifiable risk factors aside from medication. We should exercise because when we exercise, we actually lower the LDL. Um, and if you don't exercise, you not only have higher LDL, but you actually lower the HDL in the body, okay? Um, and uh, if you don't exercise, it leads to obesity, and it's which is also associated with higher bad cholesterol and lower good cholesterol and higher triglyceride levels. The higher LDL leads to a, the greater buildup of the plaque in the arteries, resulting in the processes that I've earlier described. And in terms of diet, and I will have a slide dedicated to this, um, when we talk to patients about diet management, we often tell them to remember to stop two things, saturated fat and trans fat. We'll give some examples of this later. Alcohol also raises the total cholesterol level. Um, smoking results in coronary atherosclerosis and diabetes, will, which will require a talk of its own, also raises LDL, the bad cholesterol, lowers the good cholesterol and increases the triglyceride levels. So good diabetes control is also very important. And then there are people who are just generally predisposed to high cholesterol. And this is what we call non-modifiable risk factors, such as family history and aging. Okay, The older the vessels, the more likely they are to develop fatty streaks, atherosclerosis, and coronary artery plaque, um, because high cholesterol levels also, uh, cholesterol levels also increase with age and time. So as we mentioned, having high cholesterol, there are no symptoms. And the only way you will find out is if you do a blood test. Okay, um, And I'm going to quote a study from our third speaker today. We have a wonderful panel and Dr. Ian Poon is going to address several myths with regards to the medication. He's our third speaker. But more importantly, he also leads a very cutting-edge practice in Sing Health Poly Clinic. Uh, clinics, including this study that validated that in modern practice, we don't actually need to do fasting samples for cholesterol testing. Okay, so um, right now, um, uh, most of us, we actually do away uh, with the need for fasting. What Dr. Ian Poon's study actually showed in about 470 patients with type 2 diabetes, there was very little difference in the total cholesterol good cholesterol and bad cholesterol between non-fasting and fasting results, okay? However, uh, there was a slight increase in the triglyceride component for most of the non-fasting tests. In clinical practice, if the triglyceride levels are persistently high, we would then request for a fasting sample. Otherwise, nowadays, for patients' comfort, 
and convenience, we do non-fasting. So many thanks to Dr. Ian Poon's team for leading this study and validating this in a Singaporean cohort. So when we look at the cholesterol levels, um, what makes sense, right? Uh, how do we, what, what applies? So you really should consult um, your uh, primary doctor, uh, usually your GP will be the best place uh, to explain to you your findings, especially if you are asymptomatic and this is part of health screening, because while there are stipulated levels for cholesterol that we want to target, every patient is different depending on risk profile. For example, someone who is perfectly healthy with no stroke and no heart attack, their cholesterol targets are very different from people who have had heart attacks before. For people in the higher risk group, people who have had heart attacks before or strokes, the cholesterol control is much more stringent. So they cannot just use this table. For the rest of us, you know, who are generally quite well, then this table applies. And a LDL level of more than 4.9 is considered very high and it is when your doctors will advise medication. Less than that, it's a discussion and an overall risk assessment. For HDL, there is no real medication to boost it that we practice, uh, that we can give safely. Um, but the levels of concern would be less than one. If it is less than one, it is a little on the low side. Um, usually, we would recommend some weight loss or activities like in relevant patients. And for triglycerides, it will be optimal if it is less than 1.7. Of course, these numbers I am referring to are the heart center levels of millimoles per liter. Very often in uh, health screening, um, different labs, will also use milligrams per deciliter. So you must know what the unit is. Don't worry, okay? Whatever number you get for LDL and HDL, if it is a smaller number, then you would multiply it by 38 to give it to you in milligrams per deciliter. Okay, that's the conversion unit for LDL and HDL. So um, in terms of the lifestyle changes, you know, people always um, want to ask, you know, we get all this generic advice, right? What exactly uh, do we do? How do we eat healthy? Okay, so this is from the Heart Center's website, which I find um, a very good resource for uh, validated information. Uh, we would want to advise eating healthily by eating more foods that are rich in omega-3 fatty acids and fiber, like salmon and oatmeal, and reduce the consumption of saturated and trans fats, which are often found in red meat, palm oil derivatives like margarine and desserts, okay? Uh, uh, maintain a healthy weight. For Asians, the healthy BMI is 18.5 to 22.9. Moderate intensity exercise helps to raise the HDL, the good levels, uh, good cholesterol by maintaining healthy weight. And we would advise at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise. If we take public transport and it's a 30-minute walk to and fro, um, preferably in the air con so it's not too hot, I think that would be a nice way to uh, exercise as well. Work it into our exercise, yeah? So this is some of the evidence. Again, you can take a screenshot, but it's also on our Sing Health website on how to eat. It's a bit too much detail, but if you can see the things in red, okay, please avoid processed meats like sausages, you know, lap cheong, okay. Avoid high GI refined starchy foods, uh, instant noodles, uh, white bread. Avoid fatty meat, and um, margarine, which is a pa uh, palm oil derivative high in trans fat. So I will, uh, this will segue very nicely to Dr. Lowe's talk, where she will talk to us about what's modern in practice and what we can, the tools that doctors can deploy for relevant patients who are at high risk to manage high cholesterol. So these are the takeaway messages from my talk. Not all cholesterol is created equal. Um, bad cholesterol, LDL, contributes to coronary artery disease and we have seen the two mechanisms by which this happens. And it is very important because cholesterol has no symptoms, we do recommend screening for this above the age of 40 years old. Okay, um, that's all I have for today and uh, thank you very much and uh, back to Dr. Wong. Thank you, Dr. Natliko. I think we all learned a lot that um, there's a lot to do with prevention and um, it's very important to control the LDL levels to be as low as possible so as to reduce the plaque buildup in the not just the coronary arteries which is the arteries to the heart but also the arteries to the brain and, and the arteries to the rest of the body so all this preventive work although it sounds very tedious you know 
there's like um, exercise, lifestyle changes, but overall it helps a lot. It plays a huge part to bring down um, the, the overall risk uh, to develop um, heart attacks and strokes.